Hey, everyone. Welcome to another podcast of the Horse Geeks, where we are looking at riders from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me is Deb Romero, certified Alexander Technique Instructor. So today's topic is words matter. The words we use as instructors or how we interpret words through our five senses can make a huge difference in how we actually use our bodies functionally to balance how we learn to ride, how we direct our horses, all of that. So Deb, you have a great paper you came across. Can you tell us about that paper that's specifically about the words we use giving instruction to other people? Sure. It's called Lighten Up, Postural Instructions Affect Static and Dynamic Balance in Healthy Older Adults. Um, and this was looks like it was published just in 2020. So it's a recent mm -hmm. publication. Um, so what they did is they, they use three different types of words, phrases, to ask people to change their posture. So they used a set of words that um, be totally relaxed, you know, no effort, like it's the end of the day and what kind of posture you maintain when you do that, as opposed to very effortful posture, which is, you know, the language of use a lot of muscular effort pull yourself up as much as you can, pull your chest out. And straighten then the, up. Straighten up, sit up straight. <laughs> sit all up straight. of those wonderful words we've been using actually for quite some time. And then they chose some language, which is um, as Alexander teachers, we sort of head towards and use, which is more along the lines of wanting to go up um, allow your bones to send you up, uh, using gravity to help you, language like that. Um, and then they compared what happened with all those postures. And they found that number one, when we use words like relax, we tend to go into a slump and have a very forward droopy head posture. Kind of collapsing. Collapsing, yeah, mm -hmm. collapsing. When we use the effort, we that actually is the worst for our balance. They found that when we tried to balance using a lot of muscular efforting, our balance was worse than in any other case. Wow. And so using words like you're describing the lighten up, the mm -hmm. ease, can you find the ease of motion? Can you work with gravity? Those words actually improved the use of the body. Yeah. Like the let most. your head float up on top of your spine. Mm -hmm. um, things like that instead of stand up straight. Right. And it's even sort of in the tone and the vocabulary, oh my like gosh. stand up straight almost sounds like hurry up and effort where lighten up, let your head lead the way sounds active, but not stressful and, right. and relaxing at the end of the day, I think we all collapse, you know, after being tired. So that collapsing posture makes sense. And I think um, I read that paper a while ago, and I think in there is where they have those diagrams that they actually measured muscle activity mm -hmm. and use um, with electrodes. Yes, like, they did. Yeah. Right. If you wanted to read the whole study, all of that is in here. But yeah, it was a scientific study where they actually measured muscle tone, muscle use. Well, um, what stuck with me from the diagrams that they used showing the organization of electrical forces in the body, that the best use of the body or the most efficient also generated very straight and stable electrical lines. 
of force, describing the forces of motion. And I found that fascinating, mm -hmm. that good mechanical use also sort of coalesces the forces of motion into dynamic straighter lines with less dissipation of force, which makes sense. It's efficient. Yeah, it's right? just like electricity. You don't have any impedance on the system. So there's no static or bad right. waves <laughs> right going or on. you know cut wire dissipation of that current mm -hmm. so to speak yes and and that's exactly working with the balance in horses it's feeling because we can tangibly feel force so understanding that an imbalance is a say a lateral dissipation of what should be a straightforward force is how we work with the body mechanics with horses just through what it feels like. But the words we use matter a lot. So just like that study was showing, as riders, I think we've all heard, <laughs> give more leg. What does that mean? <laughs> give right? Give to you, give to me, give to who? <laughs> right, right. Or shoulders back, right? or look where you're going, <coughs> it goes. So the way- Oh my we, gosh, the look where you're going. Oh my gosh, yeah. Right, so the look where you're going causes everybody to over-rotate the head farther than the seat can go. And as soon as we rotate our neck farther than we can rotate our sacrum and lumbar, we literally disconnect our upper body from our lower body. And all of a sudden those forces in our bodies start to dissipate laterally so the horse can't really feel the direction of our seat. Yeah, and then we're using much more muscular effort. Absolutely, which is what that study measured was sort of how much effort based on the words used in the instruction. Yes. And I look at balance or good mechanics is something that is drawn out of an individual. We don't put it in, we draw it out. That's why the words matter so much. So explain Be that a bit, you draw it out. What is so the blueprint, like we're born with an inherent mechanical design and there's a blueprint of using that machine mm -hmm. most efficiently, least stressful, um, with the greatest amount of ease and efficiency. That's inherent in the structure of the body, right? So I think the words we use to develop balance and good mechanical use have to be drawing on that inherent quality of the body. We're not- I, we're I not think that's real important. In. I think it's a huge right. concept that in, as instructors, like you working with people's bodies or me working with horses and riders, that it's the instructor can sort of think, I have to put this information in the student. And I go, no, oh, it's, okay. already, it's already there. Yeah. So you when just we, have to use the words to bring out that expression of it. To draw out the innate mm -hmm. use. And same for a horse. We think that we're teaching the horse how to balance by using our aids in the same way we would use our voice. We're making them take a frame. We're making them Oh, that's, lift that's their language back, right there. Right? Put them in We're, a frame. Put them in a frame, right? Yeah. That's the same as stand up straight for a yep. human, right? <laughs> and so we expect, just like the words sort of convey stand up straight, sort of conveys a, an unspoken expectation of using effort. Yeah, and that's what they said in here at the end. They concluded with the effortful instructions, which were based on popular conceptions of good posture. Yes. That it was like led to the worst overall static and dynamic balance. Yes. And I talked about it at the very end of the last podcast that. I had an interaction with a student recently where we're rehabbing her older horse, kind of remuscling her, getting her past some issues. 
and the movement is getting really a lot better where it's easy, it's flowing, the horse is happy, the rider is getting more feel and experiencing the ease of good mechanics. And she started to ask me, like, when do we do the competitive work? <laughs> where, where do, and, when do we work? <laughs> right. When do we work? And, and it occurred to me, I went, wow, that's part of our expectation with our horses is that to put a horse in a frame or lift their back or make them square or round or straight, which, you know, all of those meanings, um, that it's going to take a lot of effort and the horse is going to resist us. And that's just the same way we think about our own sit up straight kind of effort. We think it's so that expectation with the words we use of even competitive riding sort of has an undertone of effort and yeah. intensity. And it, it kind of shocked her. We had an interesting conversation and I said, it doesn't get harder. I said, you're already building the capacity of the body. I said, the difference is simple work versus complex work. It's not easier or harder. It's that simple work has less variables and factors and complex work has more variables, more factors you're juggling at the same time. That's what makes it complex. But the work, the, the way we do it shouldn't feel like more effort or less effort that misses the point of balance. Exactly. Right. And that <laughs> was like, I don't, it didn't even occur to me until that very conversation that that is an kind of a, a belief that's maybe so ingrained or unspoken and entrenched in our way of thinking about especially high level riding that we never question it. We never even pause long enough to think that that it could be a different experience. The, the more is better thought, which I don't agree with more is better. Or for example, people will see me riding with very short reins on a horse and assume that I'm pulling the horse's head in and that the reins are heavy. And I said, no, riding with short reins, should, the reins should not feel any heavier than if I were at the buckle. So the length of rain doesn't determine whether you're increasing or decreasing force. It's just a connection point, right? So a lot of people who would watch me ride assume if I'm riding with short reins and the horse is sort of in a frame that there's heaviness on those reins. And yeah, I go, that not there's at a all. direction. Yeah, okay. or that, yeah. That, it, that it weighs a lot in pounds. Yes. That you're having to effort against that. Yeah. And I go, no, I can have very short reins mm -hmm. that are just as light as if I had very long reins. If the horse is in balance, the short reins are no heavier than the long reins are with a horse out of balance. Right. <laughs> so the shortness of the reins, a lot of people would just look at it and assume that there's a great amount of effort going on on that rein length. And I go, no, there's no effort on the reins at all, even if they're short, because the back is doing the work. So the words we use when we're guiding, like with horses, the words we use are the amount of force in magnitude and the direction of force. So the words we use are nonverbal. It's all forces that we feel is the way we communicate with horses. But as I'm working with people and we have words, the words are really specifically trying to communicate an experience. The words themselves really don't have meaning. It's our interpretation of the words exactly. that gives them meaning, right? And one of the things I learned early on that I still see, it's just classic with riding instructors. Don't pull, <laughs> don't lean back, don't lean forward, don't let the horse do that, don't focus on that. And I go, Any, <laughs> our brain just doesn't work that way, right? No, we go to it if you say it. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't put in a precursor of don't 
and then talk about the very thing that you, you. <laughs> you, you that is undesired, right? Because as soon as you say it, it puts a spotlight right on, on that. that very thing. So the whole nervous system is actually focused on the very thing that you don't want. <laughs> Like you can't say, don't think of a pink elephant. The very first thing that comes to <laughs> mind is a huge pink elephant, right? <laughs> and if you say, don't pull, it's like in that communication of words, the internal focus of the rider is going directly to the reins, the hands, the arms, and trying to control it. But the whole spotlight becomes pulling because you can't not pull as long as you're thinking about not pulling. <laughs> and I, you hear that all the time with horses and riders. Don't lean back. And then they sit up for a moment, maybe, right? Or don't pull. And they release the hands for a moment, but the mind is now focused on pulling. So it just comes back that fast. And I think what you said, the interpretation, because... I relate it to communicating with the horse. I might not understand what you mean about like, don't sit back. What do you mean? Am I sitting back? I, yeah, I don't know what I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of the anti-instruction, I would call it, in that it's not an instruction. It's a perpetuation of yeah. the problem. So just like that paper, lighten up, instead of thinking, don't do something, it's far more productive to say, do this, which changes the focus of the mind, changes the focus of the body towards what we do want, rather than keeping the spotlight on what we, on the unwanted, the undesirable, the unwanted. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, because a lot of times when I have students come to me, they're always wanting me to fix a problem. <laughs> I have a pain here. I have this. I have this. Uh, and Mio Morales, who's a, a great Alexander teacher, focuses more on, well, what's easy for you right now? Where do you have a bit of ease? Yes. And it's, I think we do that as riders, too. We, we tend to, like you said, instruction focuses on the negative and I think a lot of people ride thinking they have to fix the horse absolutely absolutely or even good instruction like um, riding with cowboys it was always count the feet where are the feet of the horse right hmm. where are the hind feet call out left right left right and we're sort of left to figure out how to do that which is not the worst instruction, but I go, if you really break it down, we never feel the feet. Exactly. We feel <laughs> the effect of the feet moving in the saddle, right? So it's like sort of thinking that we feel the feet. No, we feel the movement generated by the feet through the back. That's what yes. we actually feel, right? And so just phrasing that differently all of a sudden, you have a different awareness of what's going on. So the forces that are generated by the horse's hind feet moving have a direct impact on what we feel under our seat, between our legs, in the saddle. That connection sparks a whole lot more than feel the feet which is even a pretty positive instruction, feel it's the feet one during of the better motion, ones. <laughs> right? But then I would get riders who go, I have no feel, I have, I just can't feel it. I feel nothing because their, their brain is thinking of the feet. Yes. Right. And they go, it's too far away. I can't <laughs> feel it. It must be subtle because it's so far away. Right. And so in the same vein of that paper, lighten up, we can ask ourselves not do we feel the feet, but what do we feel? Mm -hmm. And riders who think I have no feel, I have crap timing, my balance isn't any good. I go, but we all feel something. You can't not feel the forces of motion, double negative, but 
it, it's <laughs> like you, there's no way we can avoid the sensation in our body of the motion of the horse. As soon as we're sitting in the saddle, you're going to feel something. That's true. So the question of what do I feel starts to help riders become more aware of how much, how little force, maybe the direction the forces are going, which side of their body is being affected, are they sort of being pushed forward or pushed back by the horse, right? Then we have our own internal tendencies of being forward or back or left or right, but even internally inside our own body. Another interesting lesson I had was in guiding a rider towards better balance, she at one point said to me, sort of it, like you get, how do I know when it's right? How do I know when it's right? <laughs> and it occurred to me, I go, the answer is not outside of you. Exactly. Nobody can tell you, which was another big epiphany moment of going, wow, we're looking for something outside of us to tell us when we're right. When ultimately mm -hmm. it's an internal experience extremely internal. I think that's, and that, yeah, that speaks a lot to the way I used to ride. You know, I always used to think it had to be something from the outside to fix it. Right. Or we're judged. I mean, mm -hmm. riders, we set ourselves up to be judged regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Red marks on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get a ribbon. <laughs> I right. didn't win. We oh, love being there. judged. <laughs> and we're so judgmental of ourselves and our horses because that's part of the riding experience is regular judging. <laughs> or, the, or the right and wrong of it all, which exactly because doesn't exist either in my yes, world. There is no, and that is a mind-blowing helmet fire kind of thought. <laughs> that the only answer is where do we sense ease internally? Or where do we sense ease from the movement of the horse? Or where does our horse sense ease? That's where we build, right? We build. And, but, but balance according, like mechanical, ideal or optimal function of our inherent structure is always going to feel more efficient and the body will sense ease, even if the brain is on fire going, this is so different, I can't cope with it yet, right? There's a sense of ease coming into the body that isn't a collapsing like you described. It's not, right. it's not what we no think term. of as relaxation where we collapse our, our skeleton or collapse our frame. We're active, but active in a way that isn't excessive effort or increased stress. That's telling us we're not using our mechanics near ideal. We're moving away from ideal. Yeah. And I, for years, everybody would, instructors would say things to me like, let go of your low back. I'd be like, what? What did you that do mean? that? What do you mean, let go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that lack of, without the knowledge of mechanics and sort of a little bit of physics and really understanding what that experience means internally or how people process internally, it's like we can give instructions over and over and over, but they have very little meaning to the person hearing them. Right. Same for our horse. If it's not meaningful inside the individual, then you can repeat it as many times as you want. I was actually I had one student who was super frustrated with me because I constantly was changing my words or the approach over and over and over. And I go, but I haven't changed the principles of what I'm trying to teach. I just throw spaghetti against the wall and I see what is received. And if it's not being received, I'm going to keep changing my words. I'm going to keep using different metaphors or, 
different techniques or strategies to try to say, to try to not say the information, but impart the information so that the horse or the student experiences a change. It has to be what I call digestible information. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, it has to be that, and everybody digests differently. <laughs> so I see it. Absolutely. But, and and you don't you don't know what's going to work. So having the capability of changing your language um, instead of just repeating the same language over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> <laughs> or as the pain student, it took me years um, working with different writing instructors to shift my brain from I must be doing it wrong because I'm not getting it mm. into having the self-confidence to go to my instructor and say, I don't understand what you mean by what you're saying. Could you explain it another way? I'm not getting this. And that sort of takes a bit of self-confidence and experience on our part. We could do it in the beginning, but I think most of us start off assuming we're wrong, assuming we don't know anything. And those words of taking lessons, getting instruction, almost like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not it's wrong, intense. <laughs> but it can be kind of like we arrive at a place where we want this, we want to sort of pull the lid off the top of our head and shake a box of information in there <laughs> until we get it. <laughs> well, you know, and on the opposite side of that, I used to be the lead instructor at the massage school in Charlottesville. And I would get some questions and I, I would just say, I don't know the answer. And they, you know, you could just hear the room go, oh, what? <laughs> but you're the teacher. Yes. Yes. And I'm like, Hey, I'm human. Just like the rest of you Google it for crying it, out loud. Exactly. <laughs> and we can't all know everything. Exactly. Especially about bodies. And then if we look at human bodies and horse bodies interacting with riding a horse, that's just so much information at play that no single instructor or human is going to know everything there is to know in one lifetime. It's just not going to happen. Exactly. And so we all have maybe a different focus of what we know, what we're good at, but how we share that, I think, is where the words matter the most. And, and yeah. I think really taking the perspective, I think we talked about this once um, with the, the Socratic method of learning or, or Socrates way of teaching mm -hmm. through questions is such a great method to fall back on because then we do find the words. If we assume horses are intelligent, if we assume the body mechanics, no matter the confirmation points, the actual mechanical use of the body can be altered during motion, then we're starting, we're going to ask better questions because we're starting with the assumption of success. That's a really good point because we think we have to give answers, but really we should be asking questions. Yes. I like that. Yeah. yeah. We should be, does this work? Well, what about this? And what about this? Instead of saying, but this is what the Nazi dressage guy <laughs> told me to do. <laughs> You know, and I think, too, when we receive, like, coming back to that paper, it's a very common thing to say, sit up straight, stand up straight, right? And those type of instructions, when we say to the rider, sit up straight in the saddle, I think our initial response is always instinctual. Like, our body almost reacts before we consciously control the response. That's a good point. We go to startle is what so we do. So whether it's horses mm -hmm. or riders, it's like with a green horse, when you first put pressure on the right rein to request a right turn, their initial instinct is to push against it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think our first instinct, even as riders, when we're hearing instruction is an instinctual one 
it's, a, it's our instinctual reaction first, then we sort of have to arrive at a little bit of a conscious awareness of what we're doing in order to consciously control our reactions, even to verbal instruction. Yeah, and that goes back to working from the inside out, the internal movement instead of the external movement. Does that make sense? Yes. How do we digest and internalize the information and then how do we direct it with, an, with a conscious intention? Absolutely. And I think as students, we get to ask, what does that mean? This is what I'm feeling. Is this what you're trying to convey to me? This is how I'm experiencing it. Is this what you mean? And a lot of times we just let that, it's almost like I'll listen to lessons sometimes and I'll hear the same instruction 20, 30, 40 times in an hour. And I go, so who's getting that? <laughs> like, is it being repeated because it's not happening? Or is it being repeated because it needs reinforcement? That's a really good point. Because we will, I know with people, and I'm sure with horses, we will always revert back to the, the habit. Yes. Always, um, you know, unless we've really done a lot of internal bringing things to consciousness that habit is pretty darn strong and i'm sure the horses do the same thing is this what you want is this it is this it yes and i think with you know the way words matter is that our words are sort of guiding the mind and the body very simply either towards what we don't want or what we do want we're either focused on overcoming a problem, which sort of in a way perpetuates it because everything is focused on the problem, putting yes. a spotlight there, or we're finding the strategies and gaining the feelings of what we do want or the solution or the new habit or the new way of using ourselves. And so I think when we, as a student, when we hear what we're hearing during a lesson, we might have to consider which way are we going with this instruction, right? Are we going towards what I want or are we sort of focused on this problem? And as an instructor, I have to always think, okay, what am I hearing from the student and where am I guiding the student's focus that is then guiding the horse's focus? And that's where we spontaneously, creatively come up with the right words once we're quite clear on which way we're going. But I think those two directions of thought are mutually exclusive. Yes. It's very hard to be focused on the problem and the solution. Because the way of thinking that created the problem is not going to get you to a new solution. I think Einstein said that or somebody, some famous <laughs> scientist said that the way we thought that created the problem, we cannot continue to think the same way in order to solve the problem that was created by the way we think or something like that, something along those Isn't lines. Isn't that the definition of insanity? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over and expecting, and expecting a different, different result. result. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I think in looking at how words matter, um, the effortful instructions, I think, have a negative influence. I think it almost triggers a stronger instinctual response to give instructions that, and it's an undertone. It's not always, to me, directly related in the words, but there's like like stand up straight doesn't sound bad, but there's an undertone to the direction mm. that's, that sort of indicates you're going to use effort to do that. Where the instruction of lighten up has a different undertone to it. And I know now, in speech, they have specific things related to tone and mm -hmm. 
timbre and rhythm and all of that. I can't remember all of them, but but that's why words matter is because of that undertone that says with the instruction along with it a little bit, here's how you do it. Use effort, don't use effort. Exactly, yeah. Right, do it right or use curiosity. That's a good point. We used, when we were working with kids in elementary school, we changed the language to, can you sit up soft and tall? Right, which is that those words are going to spark a creative, I don't know, investigation of the body, a self-awareness. I could like I, that. To be I curious enough to look for something different. Exactly. And the result is the same of being straight and tall, but sit up straight almost has, it just, the meaning behind the words or the experience that's sort of conveyed through the words, I guess is more important than the actual words than, well, how do I say that? It's not more important than the actual words themselves. The words themselves convey how we're gonna go about doing it. And that's why the words matter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So she says in her in this paper, as it suggests that effortful cueing of posture during activity based therapies and trainings may actually have a negative impact on performance and fall risk. Mm. I thought that was it's right there in, in the results of the study that and if you think about it, the, the fall risk um, applies to riders, too. I mean, all the time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so efforting, I think we've seen this in riders, too, when they when they get tense. They come off easier. Oh, yeah. You're basically, yeah. you so that tighten up all those muscles and hurting. hold your posture and you become a projectile. <laughs> a projectile. <laughs> yes. No, and that was why the air amateur meme was so funny. It's like <laughs> there are exits located on both sides and the front. <laughs> front. <laughs> At different angles. Right. You may experience some turbulence during your descent. <laughs> and that's why if you think of it if you watch racing and jockeys come off they just kind of roll yes you know you don't see them putting an arm out or <laughs> right well, and it's just like they say with car accidents like with, with drunk driving accidents the the one drinking who caused the accident is ironically the one who didn't get hurt because they were too drunk to get tense <laughs> Right. And it's like the injuries are far greater when, you know, we're not drunk. We see the accident coming and we brace instinctually. Yeah. But that just increases the force impact and makes us unstable. But not that we can tell ourselves to relax in a car accident. That's not my point. But it's just when we ride, the same effect is at play. The tenser yes. we are when we ride the more of a projectile missile we become <laughs> and the harder we land. Oh, that's a good point. The harder we land. Like it's, it does more damage to land with tension than it does with some either control or at least relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. I got bucked off hundreds of times and finally learned to just sort of let my body go limp while I was flying <laughs> through the air. <laughs> but see, that's, that was, which it's, it's a learned thing. You, it is you, a learned thing. It, you have to learn to do that. And luckily I went through that period of riding when I was 16. So it didn't oh, hurt, <laughs> <laughs> but it is. And it's what um, I know martial artists and, and different athletes learn that when you have a fall, you sort of go into the momentum of the fall rather than bracing against it. You sort of let your body just relax and go with the momentum is far safer than bracing against it and tightening everything. And I don't know how we went down that side, track, <laughs> but um, what I wanted to recap was sort of, 
in the way that words matter is whether we're talking to ourselves in our heads or mm-hmm. talking to our horses in the privacy of our own minds or working with an instructor, either as the student or the instructor, we have essentially instructions that convey effort. We have what I call anti-instructions, which are <laughs> focused more on the problem, the don'ts, the, don'ts, <laughs> the problem, spotlighting and circulating, circulating around the problem rather than heading towards the wanted and the solution. So those are anti-instructions. And then we have light instructions. So those three ways that we choose words in our own heads, and especially, I think, the way we think about our horse. That's important. Right? Because like that student I worked with who was saying, when's the hard part coming? Mm -hmm. It was like, horses don't want the hard part. They don't think that way. Horses, everything is built on a sense of internal safety and comfort. And as soon as you make it hard for the horse, you can't get to balance anymore. You can't get to optimal function of the body. You can't get to high level work because it, without injury or lameness, because horses have only the instinctual reaction to either anti-instruction or effortful instruction. They're going to protect themselves from the rider rather than cooperating with the rider. So they really teach us a lot about the intelligence of the body because a human can go through physical therapy and know intellectually, we have imagination and choice more than a horse does. So we can go to physical therapy and endure a lot of pain knowing that it's better for us eventually. Mm -hmm. Horses can't do that. You cannot do physical therapy on a horse the same way you can on a human because they don't have a mental capacity of imagination and choice like a human. So it either feels good right now or it doesn't. And if it doesn't feel good, they protect what they know. They work against the rider to keep their body stable and keep everything sort of functioning because they have no clue that there's anything potentially better until they actually experience it. And our bodies are kind of more like horses than we think. I was just going to say that. I think, you know, whether we pay attention to that or not, we kind of do the same thing. Yeah. I think our body intelligence is very much like horses. Mm -hmm. And so our brain can say no pain, no gain, but our body goes not so much. (laughs) Right. Right. And now orthopedic surgery explosion shows us that the whole idea of no pain, no gain was not the best idea. Right. Right. For physical workout or developing the human body. And horses motto is no pain, no pain, lots of gain. Lots of gain. Yeah. Yeah. And so finding that ease using light instructions that build curiosity, exploration, looking for the answers of whether it's appropriate or inappropriate, we could say good or bad, right or wrong, for us. The only answer to that question is inside that individual's experience. Yes. At that moment, too, because it's going to change. Yes. Yes. So I think it's a good idea for all of us as riders to just kind of like pay attention to our thoughts when we're on our horses and go, am I, am I giving (laughs) anti-instructions? Am I spending my time on the problem or are we moving towards what we want? Even if it's little baby steps, right? Am I giving sharp instructions? Am I thinking this is going to take a lot of effort for my horse, or this is going to take a lot of effort for me. And just walking into our ride with that assumption that sets the tone. The horse feels that energy mm-hmm. right away. I completely agree. And it sets up that dynamic of action reaction between the horse and rider when we just anticipate that it's going to be difficult rather than easy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like to say set set every situation up for success. Yeah, and approach it with that thought of lighten up. Yes. Right? I love that instruction. So we will leave that today with, I think I'll walk around all day and go, hmm, am I lightening up and curious or am I efforting? Is this hard? And It'll see, be a fun day for you. See what happens. <laughs> yes. It'll be a fun day. Easily entertained. Yes. <laughs> all right. So thanks for joining us, you guys. One last recap. When we listen to the voice in our head or other people's voices, are we focused on what we don't want, giving ourselves anti-instructions? Are we expecting or conveying it's going to be a lot of effort? Or are we exploring and opening our minds to the potential that it could be light? Okay. And that mechanical function is not difficult. It's not effortful. There's a lightness to it because it already exists. We just have to kind of unearth it, but it's already in there. Yes. Any final words, Deb? I, yeah, that just changing and bringing things to consciousness, const constantly looking at yourself from the inside out. Very good. And thank you guys, as always, for joining us on the Horse Geeks podcast. Please like, subscribe, share, comment, and join us next time. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks. Be kind. <laughs>